You know what my dream was before I started doing the whole YouTube thing? I wanted to make TV shows and movies. I originally wanted to be like a film director, but then I transitioned to TV show creator, I guess. Basically because I wanted to do something creative, and I guess making a TV show meant more time for a story than a movie, I guess. And I would still like to do that, even as it increasingly becomes basically impossible. I still have ideas in my head that I think would make for pretty good, if not great, TV shows. Some things are part of an already existing property that I think that I could add like a little bit of spice or oomph to. Some are completely new and original ideas, at least as original as anything can be nowadays. Some are just sort of blink and you'll miss it things that I think of and then jot down and never really go in depth on. Some I have basically the entire show planned out, ranging from a ton of shows about like superheroes or whatever, Again, both original and adaptations. A dramatized version of the life of Eugene Debs. Some old idea I had long ago with the idea of a stoner comedy series, I guess. But there was one idea that I had that I felt was very interesting. An alternative historical fiction series based on one simple question. What if America had turned fascist during the 30s and 40s. That historical era is one of the most prominent and interesting parts of world history, being seen as one of, if not the most pivotal moments. The world was in such a dire situation that basically everything that had been historical precedent up to that point was thrown in the garbage and people rushed to whoever had a solution to the problems, which led to the rise of many new forms of politics ranging from left-wing ideologies sort of becoming prevalent due to the fact that they predicted capitalism would fail, and it did, to liberalism going in a completely different direction than it did before, and in the most unfortunate circumstances, a group of far-right dictators using this to spread their very much hateful ideologies. And while we attribute some of these things to different parts of the world, a lot of these things happened in every part of the world. And yes, that includes the idea of the rise of fascism. Because even though fascism never ended up fully becoming a thing in the United States, that wasn't due to a lack of trying. Like for real, it is kind of scary when you think how close the United States actually could have been to fascism. Which is why this historical subject is very common in a lot of alternative history. Now, a lot of them want to go the route of trying to make it so that the Nazis take over America, but it's like, no, 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 that's not, that's not it. I'm really thinking of the idea of what if the existing fascist movements in America somehow managed to win? And I thought this would be a good show idea because really the only people that covered it were people who were doing it in books or overrated video games. Seeing the void, I decided to pounce. But that was when I discovered that this show had just come out and I was worried that the ideas that I had would be too similar to what is in this one. So I actively avoided this show like the plague so that if I ever ended up getting the chance to make my idea, I would then be able to literally be able to say, I took no influence from the show because I haven't seen it. But at this point, I sincerely doubt that I will get the chance to make the show. So I figured I'll just check this out anyways and see how it is. And I'm glad I did, because this show was not only phenomenal, but also, I had very little to worry about. As even though we kind of go to a similar outcome, we go in pretty different directions. So if you haven't seen this show, or read the book that it's based on, feel free to do either of those things instead of watching this video, because this will go into spoilers, because I cannot go in depth about this show without spoiling it. I've rambled long enough, let's finally talk about this show itself. This show is of course based on a book which takes place in the early 1940s, focusing on the Levins, a working class Jewish family in New Jersey. The Levins are supposed to be a fictionalized version of the author Philip Roth's family. Beginning in June 1940, the depression is raging on, and the US is on the brink of entering into a second world war. One of the loudest opponents to the war is the lone eagle himself, Charles Augustus Lindbergh, who is pressured by a certain part of the population to run for president in the upcoming election. The divergence in history here is that Lindbergh actually decides to seek the presidency. The patriarch of the Levin family, Herman, played by Morgan Spector, 
is very politically active, and he basically laughs off Lindbergh, thinking he has no chance of beating Wilkie in the Republican primaries. He ends up beating Wilkie in the Republican primaries, but Herman still laughs him off, thinking, yeah, I mean, of course the Republican Party would do something like this, but the good majority of the American people love Roosevelt. They think that Roosevelt's doing an amazing job as president, and there is no way Lindbergh can beat Ro Lindbergh ends up beating Roosevelt. And the rest of the show revolves around what happens during Lindbergh's administration. Right off the bat, I should address the timing of this show. Yes, this show was made almost immediately as a response to the Trump administration, as Lindbergh was one of the many historical figures that Trump was compared to when he ran for president. In fact, this ended up becoming such a big issue that the author of the novel that it was based on had to make sure that the writers didn't just make Lindbergh into a Trump stand-in, because however similar you think these two figures are, they are vastly different in a lot of other things. Lindbergh was a young, charismatic guy who was a literal American icon. Trump was a failed reality TV show host. Lindbergh had power that Trump could only dream of. Like, I mean, whatever power and, like, sort of cult-like mentality you think that Trump has, and yes, that, do that it does exist, just imagine what it would have been like if Trump was literally one of the most well-known and well-liked historical figures you could think of. Like, a actual living, like, Lindbergh was literally a living legend. I know I'm rambling at this point, but you get what I'm saying. Due to this sort of big pedestal that Lindbergh really had at the time, I was expecting that Lindbergh was going to play a larger part in the show, and that the show would essentially make him a sort of American Hitler. But they actually decided to do something very interesting with him. Despite the fact that Lindbergh is sort of the catalyst of all the events of the show, he's barely in it. And when he is, everything that he does is debated by a ton of other characters, and they leave it up to you to take the information of what Lindbergh did, take the information of what the characters interpret, what Lindbergh is doing and what it means, and then let you figure out what you think is the right answer. Is he anti-war because he legitimately doesn't want America to get involved in the war? Or is he doing it because he wants to be friendly to the Nazis? And over the course of the show, he does more things that will push you to further identify with one of the other characters' interpretations. At one point, I was expecting like a scene where Lindbergh would then reveal his true intentions, but... That scene never comes being smart and leaving it up to your interpretation. Granted, they do somewhat push you in the direction that Lindbergh is a fascist anti-Semite, but they do leave the door open to him himself not being fascist or anti-Semitic, but just being way too comfortable in that crowd. And at that point, you might be thinking, okay, well then what's literally the difference between him being that and being a Nazi? And it's like... Okay, well, you got me there. There are some other historical figures that are not so lucky to get this sort of treatment, but we'll come back to that when we go over some of the critiques of the show. But first, let's talk about some of the original characters in the show. They're all great. All of these characters are absolutely fantastic. The part that I like about them is that they're all not just like one note characters, and they're not all like copy pasted the same. Each of them are different, and over the course of the show, we see how each of them look at this sort of rise in Lindbergism, I guess. We'll start off with Herman. Herman is a socialist, so he has two very distinct reasons to be weary of the rise of fascism. And we see why he's very heavily focused on standing his ground against the idea of Lindbergh being president. But we also get the sense that he's out of his prime. He's not an activist anymore, he's a man with children, and as such, he's changed his sort of political actions. There's a scene where him and his brother are talking, and Herman suggests to him to use his money and influence to try and pressure local politicians in order to reject Lindbergh, and his brother makes a quip about, So money has its uses now? Whatever happened to my hothead Deb's loving kid brother? To which Herman responds with, Never said that money didn't have a use. I just object to it mattering above everything else. Herman even saying that he is as capitalist as his brother is, despite the fact that he voted for Debs, clearly indicating that he is a little bit past his activism days. 
partially helped by his wife Bess, played by Zoe Kazan, who tries to get him to put the interests of his family before himself. His nephew Alvin, played by Anthony Boyle, takes very much after Herman in this regard, but he's clearly supposed to be Herman if he were younger. Because while Herman is an upstanding citizen, he goes to his 9 to 5, he pays his taxes, he dresses up nice, Alvin is more of a young street rat, which leads to a little bit of tension between Alvin and Herman. While Herman is trying to take Alvin and mold him into a proper young gentleman, getting him a job working for a wealthier person within the area, Alvin sees this as a huge betrayal because him and Herman are supposed to rally against the rich and yet Herman's telling him, go work for this rich guy, tying into him being younger and in that more radical phase in his politics. To the point where when things are getting more heated in America, Herman's response is simply just, we'll advocate for the next Democratic presidential candidate. Meanwhile, Alvin, flees to Canada to join their military to go fight the Nazis directly. Another family member that Herman gets into a little bit of tension with is his eldest son, Sandy, played by Caleb Malice. Sandy, like a lot of people in the show, loves Lindbergh, sees them as an American icon, and is clearly at that age where he begins to start rebelling against his dad. One, in the obvious fact that he is very interested in drawing, which is a very clear contrast to what Herman is doing for a living. But another thing seems to come from the fact that since Herman really hates Lindbergh, all this does is push Sandy to be more in line with what Lindbergh and Lindbergh's allies are standing up for politically, as that's a very common way to rebel against your parents, just be the complete antithesis of them politically. But one character that I was absolutely fascinated by in this show is not even a member of the Levin's family. The character in question is Lionel Bengelsdorf, played by John Turturro. Bengelsdorf is a rabbi who is very prominent within the school union. He is also a prominent supporter of Charles Lindbergh, basically being a star-shaped shield that projects away any accusations of Lindbergh being anti-Semitic. And throughout the whole show, you're sitting there wondering, does this guy actually believe what he is saying, or is he just BSing us? Well, yes, he of course says that he is simply just anti-war, and he doesn't believe that America should get involved, and that Lindbergh is the only candidate in the race that is anti-war, and that Lindbergh is not an anti-Semitic person. He said so himself, he's not anti-Semitic, ergo he isn't. Which might be fine to say at the beginning of the series, but as Lindbergh starts doing more suspect things, he continues to say this, such as when Lindbergh adds unabashed anti-Semites like Henry Ford to his cabinet, where Lindbergh meets with Hitler to sign an American Molotov-Ribbentrop pact, where Lindbergh invites Ribbentrop to the White House, when Lindbergh and him push for something called the Just Folks Program, an assimilation program for Jews, wording it very much like an assimilation program for Jews, having Jewish children in inner cities be moved to rural areas to become more like real Americans, and then him getting shot down when Lindbergh announces the second step to his plan, seeing that the relocation of these Jewish families and children is permanent and very much coerced, but he keeps saying that Lindbergh isn't anti-Semitic that he's just anti-war. You start thinking, there's no way that this guy actually believes what he's saying. Like, he's just BSing us, right? There's gonna be some, like, twist coming up where we find out the truth. Like, something's gonna happen that reveals everything. Like, we're gonna find out, like, oh, he's only half Jewish. Or maybe later in the show he converts to Christianity or something. Then, when he goes to have dinner with the Levins, because Sandy participated in the Just Us program, and he's also dating Bess's sister, who was played by Winona Ryder, he casually drops something that makes it all make sense. Bengelsdorf is a child of the Confederacy. After hearing that, it makes so much sense. The US South is a place where subtle racism thrives. Literally the only way you can be perceived as racist in the South is if you literally say you hate person of X race. 
anything else is somehow okay, saying phrases like wait just to cotton pick a minute, admiring symbology and figures that are literally white supremacist in nature, if it is not something that is literally just point blank in their face, they will not see it. Trust me, I know from experience. And it's even worse for Bengelsdorf, cause he was raised in an era like right after the Civil War. So his threshold is apparently higher, I guess. It's why he can call out Henry Ford as anti-Semitic, but dismisses any insinuation that Lindbergh is, and adds a little bit of catharsis as you slowly start to see Bengelsdorf slowly lose faith in Lindbergh. I know this video is pretty long already, but I want to give a brief explanation of something small that I think really shows the attention to detail within the show. Episodes 2 and 6 have election scenes that parallel each other, and in that, they decide to show the ballots of the elections in question. And they actually went into a very interesting detail to not only print the minor party presidential tickets, all of which I've covered by this point, but there's actually something a little bit more that you only notice if you look a little closer. Earl Browder is listed on the first ballot, but not on the second ballot. And I could see this as having one of two interpretations. One, that given Browder's popular front strategy that we do know happened in real life, and the events surrounding this series, perhaps, given what happens, Browder officially steps down in order to just help Roosevelt get back into the presidency, or the more likely scenario, given certain Red Scare elements that we see in the show, the Communist Party was politically oppressed worse than it was in the real world. But that might make you wonder, if the Red Scare stuff was more prominent in this show than in the real world, then how come Norman Thomas gets to stay on the ballot? Simply put, Norman Thomas probably wouldn't have faced political persecution in a Lindbergh administration because Norman Thomas aligned with Lindbergh. Given the fact that it was revealed that Levin was a socialist as well, I thought that would have been a, like a mention in the show. Like maybe it would have been like Norman Thomas enters the scene and then he's just like, ah, uh, this is why I don't vote for the socialist party anymore or something like that. If that's intentional, which I do believe it is, I have to give major props to the show. Now, even though I've spent a while giving the show a lot of praise, I have to acknowledge a couple of critiques that I have to the show to varying degrees. I do not think that it is enough to ruin the show, but I do think that it does raise a couple of eyebrows with the show. For starters, a critique that the show probably would like to hear, the show should have been a little longer. The show is six episodes with around an hour each. You'd think that would be enough time to tell a story, and yes, it does tell a good story, but surprisingly, I think it could have expanded on a lot of elements. And before you go in the comments to say, they would have had to deviate from the book. We'll put a pin in that for later. But I think there were a lot of things that they could have added that, gave, that would have given it more depth that was sadly left out. And if they had more time to show it, I think maybe it could have done the show wonders. For example, they bring up the fact that Lindbergh wants to run for president, and that it's so controversial that even Wendell Wilkie publicly opposes him. It then does a scene transition, and then the primaries are over, and Lindbergh is already the nominee. Wouldn't it have been more interesting to see Lindbergh, like, go through the primaries? Like, for example, we see this sort of with Herman when they go through it in the general election. Like, he could have simply brushed him off and said, like, oh, Wilkie has, Wilkie's gonna beat him, doesn't really matter, Wilkie's gonna win. And then we see that he gets, maybe he gets a little more scared after the primaries, and then we see maybe he takes the general election run a little bit more seriously. I would say of the main cast, or at least the ones that have a prevalent role in the show, the one that could have benefited the most from this was Sandy, because there are some aspects of Historic that I just felt like... It's a little too, it's a little too fast. Like over the course of these six episodes, we're supposed to see the wedge between him and his father grow exponentially, then eventually shrink back so that they're close again by the end of the show. Except it goes a lot like we see a lot of the divide, but then they quickly rush into them coming together. They do make the situation dire enough that a quick them coming together makes sense. But I think even then we should have seen a little bit more. 
One of the prime examples of this is from the Just Us program. Sandy is given the opportunity to go to a farm in Kentucky as part of the Just Us program. And it is built up that this is going to be a very big thing in the show. It is a huge divide. Whenever Sandy brings it up to his father, his father's just like, no, I don't want to do this. And then over the course of one episode, Herman's supposed to ease up on the idea of letting his son go experience the world. It's built up as this really big thing. And in the next episode, Sandy's home again. I thought we'd at least get one episode of Sandy just doing this farm work as part of the Just Us program, especially considering during the trip, like when he comes back, he only shows his little brother Philip what happened. And one of the things that he reveals to his brother was that when he was there, they did prayers, like Catholic or like Christian prayers, and that he ate a pig. That's clearly supposed to be a very big thing, him not being kosher and him like drifting away from his Jewish heritage, which is supposed to be what the Justice Program is supposed to do, which is why they're targeting Jewish children. But we don't feel the impact because we didn't see it. We're being told that it happened. And the number one rule of storytelling in this medium is show, don't tell. Another character that could have used some tweaking is Evelyn, Bess's sister. I thought she was good, don't get me wrong, but I don't know. She left a lot more to be desired. Like, she really just does kind of seem like she's along for the ride just to have a wedge between two sisters. I know this would have been a big deviation, but it would have been interesting if they actually gave Bengelsdorf's story to Evelyn. Would have probably given her a lot more to do in the show. Now, a lot of the smaller complaints that I have of the show revolve around one historical figure, senator from Montana in the time, Burton K. Wheeler. I think they kind of botched up Wheeler. For starters, Daniel O'Shea doesn't look anything like Wheeler. Like, I'm sorry. He just... When I found out that this is supposed to be Wheeler, I was just like, what? Compare him to Ed Moran as Henry Ford or Ben Cole as Lindbergh. Absolutely spot on. But this is a minor critique compared to a lot of the other problems. Remember how I talked about how them making Lindbergh more ambiguous and they let you come to your own conclusions regard to him and how you view him as whether he is legitimately well-intentioned or an evil fascist? Yeah, Wheeler is given quite the opposite treatment. To the point where some of the things that they have him do in the show make no sense. One of the first problems, they make him Lindbergh's running mate on the Republican ticket. Yeah, uh, what party was Wheeler again? And yes, I know, he ran against the Democrats at one point before, but that was on a third party ticket. If you wanted to have a straight GOP ticket, you have a ton of Republican isolationists you could choose from. Or if you are desperate to have the Lindbergh Wheeler ticket, why not have it be a still existing union party? As they did plan to run Wheeler in 1936, and given the party's history, you can actually see why someone like Wheeler and someone like Lindbergh would support the Union Party. And the reason is, he differed from Lindbergh on more than just a partisan label. Wheeler was well known for being part of a part of the progressive wing of the Democratic Party, or I guess populist depending on your interpretation. He was a diehard supporter of Roosevelt during his first terms and only soured on him after the court packing attempt, but maintained firm in a lot of his other stances. Lindbergh's administration is portrayed as a standard conservative administration with, of course, further right tendencies. And Wheeler is just portrayed as part of that group. Like, there's a part where they literally start advocating for, like, cutting certain social programs. It's like, I don't think Wheeler would support that. Funnily enough, the year that they have Wheeler run as a Republican in the show, the real-life Wheeler was supposedly voting for a socialist. And at a couple of points during the show, they have people talk about Lindbergh and Wheeler and saying, if we get rid of Lindbergh, if Lindbergh is impeached or something, Wheeler's gonna be far worse. But that only makes sense if you watch the show and don't know anything about Wheeler. If you know about Wheeler, you know that that's not true at all. This is one of the few times that they let the Trump comparisons really just control the whole narrative. Because this is clearly supposed to be a reference to the pe people who, who didn't like Trump and like, Pence is far worse. And a more blatant thing that shows that this really doesn't make sense 
is when Wheeler ends up succeeding Lindbergh, he declares martial law across the United States. Despite the fact that Wheeler was a noted opponent of people declaring martial law before. So again, doubt. And I'll make one thing perfectly clear before we get into the last thing. I'm not saying that you can't critique Wheeler for anything that he has done in history, or that I don't understand why the people who made this product might have a interpretation of Wheeler that is not really that positive. Wheeler has done a lot of things that are very suspect, things that are very, very bad, and many of the people who thought it was really, really bad, including Congressman Jerry O'Connell, would pass around a pamphlet decrying Wheeler for supposedly being a fascist. The name of the pamphlet in question? The Plot to Destroy America, Senator Wheeler and the Forces Behind Him. The last major criticism of this show has to be in regards to the ending, and again, this will require a lot of explanation. In the original novel, Lindbergh flies off after doing a speech, then disappears. Wheeler then takes over and declares martial law, scapegoats Bengelsdorf by saying he is part of a British slash Jewish plot to take over America, and then declares martial law to try and get the US back on track. But after the US descends into massive chaos, Mrs. Lindbergh then holds a press conference to call for the United States to hold an emergency election alongside the United States midterms, as well as propose a theory alongside Evelyn and Lionel that Lindbergh was actually killed by the Nazis because he stood up for the Jews. Roosevelt runs and wins in a special election, then the timeline is restored. The show decides to take this and tweak it a little bit. For starters, one thing that I will praise, they actually decide to leave the ending vague. Not only do they cut right before the election results are stated, but they also show that Roosevelt supporters are being suppressed, thus adding some doubts on whether or not voting actually saved the day. But the one change that actually kind of irks me is how they changed Lindbergh's disappearance. You see, Alvin Levin is invited to a meeting with a British agent who needs his military expertise to take down Lindbergh. Alvin is then brought to an undisclosed location because he knows how to read a radar. He scans for Lindbergh's plane, he finds it, and then almost immediately loses it. Alvin apologizes thinking that he failed, but everyone else doesn't seem to really mind that much. While not explicitly stated, it is heavily implied that this group of people is the reason why Lindbergh disappears. The show's writers stating that the reason why they made this change was because they wanted the loudest anti-fascist voice on the show to actually contribute to the plot, because in the book, after Alvin returns from war, he shuts down and basically just becomes a blank slate for the rest of the novel. My biggest issue with this version of the plot is, by this set of events happening, they justify what Wheeler does. The reason why Wheeler does all this is because he thinks that a group, a secret cabal of people were trying to take down Lindbergh, and a secret cabal of people literally just took down Lindbergh. Ergo, he literally has justification for doing what he's doing. The whole point of that is literally to have Wheeler just go into a conspiratorial mindset. It's supposed to be the scapegoat, like, like what fascist leaders are supposed to do. It's supposed to be that. This is supposed to be Wheeler's big lie, even though this is supposed to be something that just was an accident. Similar to a real life event that happened to a politician with a very similar history. People were theorizing that there was some sort of like secret cabal or secret reason why he died in a plane crash, but it just, it was just an accident. It, that happens sometimes. And that's how it should have remained. It should have been just an accident that happened. And then Wheeler takes that and then uses it for nefarious political purposes. I know it's kind of rich coming from me, a person who hasn't even read the original book to say this, but I really think that the writers of the show genuinely didn't understand the point behind this scene. They think, oh, if we still have him throwing Bengelsdorf under the bus, that's, that is the thing that shows you that he's bad, that Wheeler is bad. 
No, the point is that this whole story that he made should have been made up. That is why he should have been portrayed as the bad guy. Again, otherwise, this show is really good, and I highly recommend it to anybody who actually likes this kind of content. Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like, comment, share, and subscribe, and click the bell to notify a future video of mine comes out. And if you're interested in more content from me, you can go to my website, follow me on Twitter, join my Discord, or consider supporting me on Patreon. Ah, perfect. This is exactly the position we need him to be. Question. Why are we not going out there now? Because this is how he writes every sermon. Before we're able to strike, we need E to be at his weakest point. With each passing day, E gets chipped even more so. And when it's chipped far enough, we'll finally be able to strike. He can sense his feelings. Wait, do you not feel this too, Biba Killer? I have zero clue what he is talking about. Your connection is not the same as ours. It makes sense that you don't feel him. It's because you were not created with the intention of becoming an XP. The other two were. So Nintendo feels this too? I would assume so. But that begs the question. How can you feel it? And how can you tell that things are shifting? That I can't say. But what I can say is... It was a slow burn. But something must have happened to just give me the power that I have. So are we waiting for a particular feeling? It can be anything that can drive him to that point. Doubt, regret, sadness, burnout, whatever. It doesn't matter. But after enough of that, boom, we strike.